Can I? Oh, yes, I am. Yeah. Can anybody hear me now? Yes. Good. Right, so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Simon Elliston Ball. I'm a product manager at Hortonworks. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, you have, uh, problems that we're solving around cybersecurity and how the scalable platforms that we're building uh, solve those problems. So this is going to be a, uh, a fairly business level track. This is on the business track. Uh, if you really want to go into the technical details, I can touch some of that. But just to get a quick idea of the audience, how many of you are more on the kind of strategic business side and how many technical? Sorry, business first. Okay, technical. Okay. How many of you can read labels on tracks? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, I will, I will dig into some of the detail and um, give you a little bit more of the technical side. So, yeah, the, the smattering of you there can just zone out for, yeah, if I, if I start to get too geeky. Um, the other thing I'd like to ask is how many of you are security people or work in a security function? Okay. And how many of you uh, work in a more big data type function? Okay, so anyone who didn't put their hands up to either of those, are you lost? Uh, okay, good. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, that's me. Um, I've been doing Hadoop things for a while. Um, this I just wanted to share because it's extremely cute. This is an origami elephant from our London office. Um, the thing about rolling big data infrastructures is often it is a little bit like doing origami. Uh, yeah, anyone can take a piece of paper and fold it. Not everyone can produce these beautiful little elephants. I did try, but not for very long. So when we're talking about cybersecurity these days, it's really changing quite a lot. And the kind of threat sources that are facing an organization are very different now to what they were. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the real threat sources are. This thing up here, this is, a, this is an IP camera. It's hooked onto the side of my house. It's for watching where my cat gets in trouble. That's what it is to me. It's very handy. It's a little bit of security. Lots of people have them. However, to a botnet master, this is a CPU with an incredibly high speed internet connection, which is capable of easily put streaming HD level video uh, at about 12 and a half megabits per second. So I can use that for all sorts of things. One of the most high profile attacks recently which really speaks to scale and how scale of attacks has really changed in the last few years was the Mirai botnet, which mainly consisted of these. Not these, these. I'm a security obsessor. The, the, the firewall is insane around this for something which is just in someone's house. Uh, but for yeah, the majority of these devices, they're being kicked out in the hundreds of thousands, in the millions even. Yeah, they're being produced cheap. They're being engineered by... Any hardware engineers in the room? Are we all software people? Good. We can be rudish about the hardware engineers and the fact that they tend to focus much more on how much they can do with uh, yeah, a couple of megabytes of memory on a small embedded chip than they do about how much they should be encrypting and providing proper security protocols. But all these devices that end up out there, yeah, their CPUs are getting better, their capabilities are getting better, they're all being hooked up to nice big fast fiber internet connections, and they're all causing uh, you know, us poor innocent enterprises a huge problem. So when Mirai attacked uh, the Dyn DNS East Coast network, there were reports at points during that attack, unconfirmed I should point out, but because no one could really figure out how to measure the full volume of this attack speed, of over 1.2 terabits per second of traffic hitting Dyn DNS servers. How many of you have an infrastructure that would be quite happy with accepting 1.2 terabits of data into it as well as its normal load? This is the real threat. 
even recording, even, even being able to keep up with that kind of level requires significantly different scaling propositions than a traditional uh, security stack. There are over half a million devices in this attack at its peak rate. That's a lot of things to keep up with. And uh, yeah, this, this obviously all resulted in the uh, infamous DDoS attack on DynDNS, which took down uh, a large number of the most popular websites for uh, the US East Coast. Uh, briefly, New York profit and productivity was off the charts because Twitter and Facebook were both affected. The other real threats you get are your own people. It's your employees of a threat in several ways. Firstly, there's you know, the accidental insider threat. Phishing is a huge problem. People who will click on anything you send them that's got a cat, it might be a cat picture. We're a little bit past that for most organizations, uh, but you know, a lot of people have tried to solve this with training, basic training, and conversely, the attackers have got a little bit better. You know, there are ev even uh, cases where advanced security researchers have got pretty close to falling for some very well-crafted spear phishing attacks. You know, and, you know, th these days, if you receive a Google reset email, a password reset email, for example, I, I would just never, never. They're getting really convincing now. So that's part of your threat. And of course, the profusion of mobile devices. You know, bring your own device, uh, that, the whole trend around that. What we're finding is that IT can no longer take that approach that they used to of, well, we don't allow that. We lock it down or you know, we, we encrypt that. You know, that's no longer a viable approach uh, for providing availability of service to your business workers. And you know, we, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things get blamed on the millennial generation. But you know, they are requiring working practices that take devices and take data outside of our traditional firewall environments. So those are the kind of environments that we now have to protect. So we have to consider things well beyond our traditional you know, nice walled garden. Not to mention the fact that our nice walled garden is already full of weeds. The other kind of key things which are coming up a lot more and you, know, you hear a lot more about these days are things like ransomware attacks. Uh, you know, ransomware, I'm sure you're all aware of, it's the principle that someone will come along, infect you with a little bit of malware and encrypt your hard drive. That's if you're lucky. Uh, if you're in an enterprise environment, it'll also do things like encrypt all of your things on your network shares. Um, these are the kind of things which uh, you really want to catch unbelievably fast. So the scale issue has gone not just from being about sheer volume of traffic like you get with those kind of you know, IoT-led DDoS attacks, or even the diversity of traffic that you get from the multiple locations of you know, all of your, your mobile workers and you know, the profusion of devices that they have, but also from the need for absolute speed to nip things in the bud, catch things before they become a problem. So security departments can't deal with systems which are now taking minutes, hours, days to notice things. The average advanced persistent threat, uh, according to Verizon's breach report last year, sits in a network for about eight months. So this brings us to another problem that modern SOCs have, uh, which is essentially you just can't store enough data. You can't store and query eight months worth of data in a traditional SOC a traditional SIM platform. So who are the people who are causing us all these problems? This is uh, yeah, a characterization of the motivations behind cybersecurity hackers. How many of you are you know, deep cyber industry people in here? Or who's, who's heard of Mises before? Yeah, that's cheating, I know you know. <laughs> So this is a characterization of, it was essentially, yeah, someone sat down and tried to figure out what it is that's motivating all of these hackers, all of these script kiddies, all of these people who are constantly breaking in, you know, all of these people who are representing you know, the, uh, you know, well, quotes very widely, but you know, 10 to 80% of your actual traffic, depending on who you are, uh, that come from hacking attempts. And yeah, they came up with this acronym uh, yeah, that they're basically all about 
making a little bit of money, so maybe you know, making some cash out of you conning you into downloading something. Uh, yeah, a lot of it's eager entertainment. Yeah, some of them are hacktivists. Uh, some of them are just looking for social acceptance in the hacking group. So this is your traditional kind of script kiddie hacker. But they're not the threat anymore. This concept came out in 2004. This is when Max Kilger came up with the concept of Mises. And it was really focused on those kind of what you'd almost call junior hackers. This is not what we're up against now. What we're up against now is a big business. The business of hacking, the business of ransomware, of malware, is a trillion dollar business a year. It's larger than many countries. It's an organized industry now. Um, access is bought and sold in marketplaces on the dark web uh, for this. Yeah. Your LinkedIn account is going to cost someone about, what is that, uh, yeah, some tiny fraction of a Bitcoin. Yeah, five Bitcoins will get you 100 LinkedIn accounts. Less than that, it's, I think it costs, um, costs around $15, someone was uh, telling me from their report uh, yeah, earlier, to buy everyone's personal information. All of your classified PII information is for sale for about 15 bucks. Hackers are for sale. Access is for sale. You can pay you know, pennies an hour to rent a botnet uh, to attack someone. Criminals are really are, you know, they're the ultimate in cloud delivery platforms. You know, they've got these 500, uh, you know, you know, half a million devices in a botnet. They really are just providing criminality as a service. You know, they've got, they're ahead of us in, that, in uh, platform as a service. They have communities, they share information. Um, you know, the cost metrics are also massively asymmetric. You know, if, I, if you can go on to, um, I wouldn't, if, if one were to go onto the dark web and hire a botnet for a DDoS attack, it's gonna cost you about $5 an hour. That's better than Amazon. You can't even get spot pricing that low. To defend against that, people are spending on average about $40,000 an hour. This just isn't sustainable. So we need to learn to cooperate together and work together on this to, to beat that scale factor. So what are our security people facing right now? They are absolutely drowning in the data. We have IDS systems, we have antivirus systems, we have proxy logs that catch these things, we have firewall logs that catch these things. And what we do is we sit junior people in front of screens that spin past uh, yeah, an average of, well, I've, I've seen people looking at hundreds of thousands of messages a day coming off of just one IDS system. That's one person sat there going, oh, that one, maybe? Yeah, they're able to process tiny, yeah, single digit percentages of the things that are coming at them, you know, huge numbers of false positives. You know, all those Mises that we don't care about anymore. Yeah, you know, it's like, great, yeah, your port scan got blocked because you were an idiot. That's still generating work for a SOC analyst who's looking at that alert and shouldn't be. There also aren't very many of them. It's very difficult to find people who actually know anything about the cybersecurity uh, realm. You know, some countries are starting to improve their massive short, uh, staff shortage, but there are currently thousands of open wrecks across uh, the United States and, in fact, most other countries. You know what? The only country whose actual requirement for cybersecurity or, or the, the skills versus available versus the uh, you know, demand gap, the only one that's been going down over the course of last year has been Italy. So well done, Italy. Um, but you know, they're still, they've still got a significant gap. Uh, yeah, everyone else is seeing massive increases in demand for cybersecurity professionals, and no one sat there you know, with uh, training to get the job. I'm sure we've got programs to start to educate people more, but that's a lead time. We've got to make these people more, we've got to make the people we do have more efficient. Because otherwise, they're just going to shift jobs every six months because someone offers them an extra five grand, and, you know, at which point you lose all your knowledge. We also have a massive long tail problem. 
that huge amount of data that we're all drowning in, what are we looking for? You know, if, you look at, uh, if you look at all the data that comes off your network, think about a log that has every file anyone's ever accessed in it, every packet that has gone across your switches, or even just a record of the metadata of every packet of every switch. Some of that's going to be, some of that's going to be legitimate. In fact, the vast majority of it's going to be legitimate. So we're also looking for very, very tiny problems. We're looking for very, very weak signals coming from these people who actually know what they're doing. I knew you know, a, a script kitty will set up alarms all day long uh, yeah, everywhere and get blocked within seconds by a halfway decent sock. But the real threats and the lurking insider threats and the persistent threats that have been sat around on the network for months undetected, they're there because they're producing tiny signals of activity. They know what they're doing. They know how to sail under that radar. So we're looking at something which is actually quite hard to solve with traditional methods. You know, a lot of data science uh, and you know, a lot of the kind of standard BI analytics that we're looking for is geared towards looking for the big trend. It's not necessarily geared for looking for the tiny, minuscule outlier, you know, the, the one in 10,000 case, which is actually a real threat. So we find it very difficult to use uh, a lot of the traditional techniques that we've used to, to capture those. So we've had to develop essentially a new approach and a new, we've, we've had to look at a lot of the data science and anomaly detection the other way up so that we can pick out those tiny signals uh, while avoiding all the false positives of the, uh, you know, of the majority. So what are we fighting this stuff with today? We've got sims, we've got log stores, we've got yeah, things like Elk, we've got maybe uh, yeah, th something like a Gigastore or a Gigamon, a packet store that's recording everything on our network, and we've got some threat intel feeds, and we've got some forensics tools, and we've got things like Wireshark, and we've got a bunch of people who are using these other things over here, and we've probably got some tools, and yeah, I, I, bet, there's, I bet most of you've got some sort of endpoint agent has your central IT recently installed something on your laptop that takes away at least one of your cores all day uh, to record what's going on and try and you know, claims that it's doing advanced machine learning on it to protect you from viruses, uh, but is actually just kind of looking at signatures that change a little bit. Yeah, we've got all these kind of pieces. Then you've got all the kind of fancy new uh, user behavior analytics pieces, which are over there in something that a startup installed on a different system. And yeah, this is, um, there's a reason why the walls of SOC centers have banks and banks of monitors. It's because they've got, about a, they've got about 30 different dashboards they've got to try and watch and correlate you know, in their heads by hand. These systems tend to be very, very siloed as well. They don't interoperate. They don't integrate well. We would talking to a customer recently about a phishing attack that they were subject to. Just going through the process that the analyst went through to try and yeah, address this kind of common everyday phishing attack, they had to log into seven separate systems, seven different consoles, and submit two support tickets to external teams to get the information they needed to know whether it was actually a, really an attack or not. So we've got a classic silo problem, right? It's just like those old days when the databases were siloed. We've also got rules in a lot of these systems. Most of these systems are based on static rules. So what you have is you have a, a system, you have an, an intrusion detection system, for example, which says, OK, if I've seen 30 logins, 30 failed logins within the last five minutes, then someone's trying a brute force password attack, block that account or block that IP address or source or whatever. You know what? That's going to fool the 14-year-old script kitty who's downloading a brute force tool off the internet. Certainly not going to fool an advanced hacker who goes, fine, all right, 29 times, wait five minutes. They've got all the time in the world to wait for that. That's going to sail underneath all of your rules. We're talking to you know, uh, a customer the other day who has three and a half thousand rules in their SIM system. Maintaining those rules is a nightmare. Keeping all these rules up to date. We have other customers who have 
you know, rule sets which have evolved over such a period of time that there's now you know, about half a person who actually understands them. And every time they have to change a rule because of a particular event or put an exclusion in there, you know, their rules rot. It's like, it's like code rot, but way faster. Yeah, they, that, that kind of collection of knowledge feels often like it's a huge asset in your organization, but often it's actually hampering you from finding things. Someone's put in an exception because of some upgrade from a year ago. Now that's buried deep in your rules, and that's a backdoor that you've actively introduced into your rules framework. So rules are, as often as not, a liability rather than an asset to your security protection. And then, of course, there are all the shiny new tools. And yeah, there are lots of new startup companies. They've all, uh, they've all got a PhD in a particular algorithm. And they've come out of university and want to productionize that algorithm. So, and yeah, they turn up to shows like RSA. So I was at RSA recently, went around, saw uh, there are about 650 different vendors there, uh, all of whom had yeah, their own tool which was another silo, and so you kind of went, that algorithm is fantastic. I really need that algorithm to protect my data set. How do I get it? Like, ah, oh, right, well, what you do is first you uh, go through a boring sales cycle. Then what you do is you download our package and you build a cluster and you put it on an independent cluster and you get our black boxes and then you install our agents on every single one of your machines. But don't worry, they're lightweight agents and the fact that you've already got 50 of them is not a problem. Um, and then you, uh, you know, put our capture devices in each of your locations, and then we can turn it on. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Next. Um, so there's this huge problem with the actual access to this innovation right now. There's no means or there's no easy means for people to be able to just plug into a data source. There are no data standards which have stood up. Yeah, there are plenty of data standards. It's like the classic XKCD cartoon I'm sure everyone's seen. Yeah, there are uh, 14 competing standards. We must fix this by unifying them all. Um, there are now, yeah, actually, that usually results in about 20 <laughs> new standards, that, that approach. But, um, so we've got a lot of very cool new things, which are just essentially accentuating the problem. They're still point solutions uh, without, the, uh, without proper integration. Uh, that said, some of them do have very pretty dashboards. So how can we solve some of these problems? Obviously, yeah, this being you know, 2017, we're going to start off by using magic, um, as I call it, or machine learning, as some people will call it. Machine learning definitely has a role in this solution. A lot of those shiny point tools will tell you that one machine learning algorithm is the solution to everything, and that machine learning will save us all. It is an absolutely key and central part of what we need to solve this problem. But we need much more than just machine learning to solve this problem. We also need some good old-fashioned scale, which is, well, old-fashioned. Is Hadoop old-fashioned? No. 10 years. It's stable. We need some good, stable big data engineering to solve a part of this problem. Yeah, we need single view to bring this together. But we do also need some machine learning magic. And we need that for things like triage automation. We can solve that drowning problem. We can solve the problem that most of the people sat in that sock are going, no, 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 oh, no, yes, um, by essentially doing a lot of the grunt work of prioritization more effectively upfront and automatically with things like classifiers, uh, with things like uh, yeah, deep learning networks to classify and score events before they hit someone's screen. Uh, with things like, and you know, this is where the machine learning really gets a lot better by putting the human in the loop, by having feedback and reinforcement learning driven from the behavior of those very rare analysts that we can't find enough of. Every time they click, that's information for our machine learning algorithm. Um, we can also use it for detecting the unknown unknowns, that long tail problem that we had. Machine learning will spot the thing that the board analyst didn't, doesn't tend to get very tired. Uh, you tend to need to retrain it periodically and keep it fighting fit. 
but it, it doesn't often get bored of scrolling down the same list of 100,000 alerts. The analyst does and tends to just go, oh, yeah. They'll miss things. The machine learning will pick up the things that, have ju that they've just glossed over. However, there's another important part about this, and uh, yeah, this really, this is my dig at some of the shiny new black box tools. A lot of the algorithms that are you know, used in these are very, very black box based. So they don't have a lot of trust. They're also not very actionable. So when you find something which is, you know, it's like this, this is a bad thing. Why? Because I told you so. Yeah, you know, our machine learning algorithms are treating us like children. I think it should be the other way around. We should be training them how to behave, not the other way around. So what you really need is algorithms with a little bit of parsimony, algorithms which will actually explain themselves and give you a clue to the lineage of how they arrived at that particular threat being a, a real threat. So that when you have something that does genuinely pop, you can see why it is. The reason for that is that you can then go and find the source and fix it faster, rather than just getting a black box which will say, ah, okay, what do I do now? The other really key and important piece where really the scaling solutions come in is real time. Real time has become increasingly important for cyber for several reasons. Firstly, it's this concept of data in motion. Have you heard any of us at Hortonworks talk about data in motion over the last few days? You've heard that once or twice? Yeah. We love it. The reason for this is that we're fed up of waiting for everything to be loaded into a database or a you know, file system before we can actually ask any questions of it. If we're going to get to uncovering threats like ransomware faster, we need to be able to ask, or yeah, even the kind of you know, high-speed, high-moving DDoS-type threats, we need to be able to ask those questions long before we've got to emptying the disk cache. We can't go for that approach of load everything into a system, then query it back anymore. We need to ask the questions while the data's still on its way in to get that latency down. So uh, one of the things we've done, for example, with our cybersecurity project, Apache Metron, is to put an incredible amount of work into the architecture to reduce the amount of latency of a message passing through that system so that we can respond to things in milliseconds instead of minutes. Because yeah, minutes can be too long. Although I do as I like um, yeah, on anything real time, it's always a good idea to check what people mean by real time. It's like, is it real time? the brake system in my car, or is it real time, ah, oh, 15 minutes is okay. In cybersecurity, it's somewhere in between. The other important thing about real time is the real time enrichment of all this data. All those people who were going and looking at those seven different consoles to try and get context around a threat that they'd seen, those people were looking at the information as it existed then. Yeah, they weren't looking at, yeah, they weren't looking at data that well, they was from when the threat actually fired. They were looking at the world now. What they actually need to be doing is looking at the world when the problem happened. So by doing real-time enrichment on data and enriching data at the source as it comes in, you can get a much realer picture of what the world is like when it matters, not what the world is like two hours later when you get around to investigating a problem. So for the, te for the technologists, I did promise I'd go a little bit geeky on this, even though it's the business track. A lot of the work we've done about, around latency is uh, this wonderful split join pattern you see very sort of yeah, faded out so it doesn't scare uh, yeah, the, the executives. But that, uh, yeah, that design pattern enables us to run very, very large numbers of enrichments, very, very large numbers of models, and yeah, very, very large numbers of score inputs. Uh, in parallel uh, through Storm. So we use Storm to achieve task parallelism rather than data parallelism as you would get in most streaming frameworks. Okay, jacket back on business. So what does this mean for your analysts? What value do you get as a business from this? You're gonna get better data going into those socks, which means your analysts are gonna perform much better. 
they're getting the fully enriched data so they don't have to spend time copy pasting things between multiple consoles. They're getting the real context rather than, you know, something that's probably a close enough approximation but has moved on. They're also getting consistency of that data, consistency of that context, and consistency of the format and schema and approach to that data uh, through a nice a common data object model. So they know what they're looking for and they know what every field means every time. It's not changing uh, you know, depending on what device they happen to mean. Some devices will, uh, you know, many devices will spit out information which has an IP source and a destination address, for example. There's very little consistency as to what those mean. Is that from the device's perspective, from a proxy's perspective? Is it from a client perspective? I don't know, it depends on the vendor. What we need to do is standardize across those pieces so that the semantic meaning of the data is identical, whatever the source of that data. And what that will get you is much faster triage. So those people looking at all those events, seeing if they're false positives or not. Previously, they could address a tiny percentage of those events. Now they can start to address a lot more because they're getting much better information. They can make their decisions faster. So better data. The other thing that you can get from the scaling platform is the fact that you can bring in all sorts of other data. So traditionally, you know, SIMS security platforms, you have a bring in your proxy logs, your net flow, some information about your uh, maybe operational network, um, some uh, endpoint vulnerability scans, you know, this port is open, that kind of data. That's all good, useful security data. What it doesn't do is put your data into a business context so you can really understand the risk. What it also doesn't do is tell you who those people are. I was like, great, I've got a proxy log which has an IP address in. This IP address has done something bad. Okay, fine. Is that IP address the you know, PC behind the you know, front desk that displays the pretty graphic for, to impress sales prospects when you walk in? Um, or, yeah, and I, I don't really care too much about that. Or is it the, um, is it the head of IT's yeah, root admin console? At which point I'm going to start caring a lot more about that being compromised. Bringing in all of that kind of asset type data. You know, we've even had people talking about um, doing things like bringing in video surveillance data. You know, this person just logged into this. Can I correlate that against the facial recognition from the CCTV camera in the corner of a room? Yes, that's kind of useful. Uh, if you can bring in those any form of data to be able to do that, then you get a much more sophisticated view of what's going on with your organization. Uh, so you bring in your HR data, you bring in your physical security data, you bring in content of email, for example, uh, you bring in raw network packet level data. Because we're building on scalable big data technologies uh, without the strict adherence to schema that you get with the traditional tools, which are mostly, by the way, you know, Oracle databases underneath. So you know, they have things like, yeah, they'll let you bring in some custom data, but they'll let you bring in like six fields of custom data. Um, because of the flexibility of a platform we're building on, we can bring in quite literally anything that can support that security case as long as you can sort of write a parser that parses enough of it to be interesting. It's a very schema on read type approach as well, which makes it very efficient for your data engineers to do the minimum work for the maximum return. The other thing you get is much longer term data. You know, we said, what was it, eight months, the average attack I mentioned? Yep. Eight months is the kind of time that it'll take you to notice that someone's been messing about in your network. Most, I'd say probably the average of people we talk to probably have about, what, what do you reckon, two, three months data stored? Well, it ranges from kind of two weeks to, yeah, three or four months if you're yeah. really lucky. Yeah, I talked to someone the other day who said, well, we can't really put more than four days worth of data into our sim. We can't query over more than four days. How are they going to find the guy who's been there for eight months? So the sheer scalability and the, um, the cheap storage, the classic Hadoop story, really comes into its own there as well. The other piece that you get is really, because of the flexibility of integration, you get a much more executable response. 
Uh, all that stuff I was talking about, about how we explain the principles behind why rules fire and why machine learning models give you a certain score. A parsimony element for uh, the data scientists among you. There's a reason for that. It's because it means that we can actually act on the results. There is no point in me kicking out an alert that something's gone wrong if I can't do something about it to fix it. It's just depressing, frankly. So what we need is something which will provide us real actionable results. So for example, I was talking to uh, yeah, a customer the other day. They have uh, some uh, ransomware detection pieces. They, they feed in uh, yeah, a variety of feeds which trigger, increase the confidence of uh, an event. And so they might have, say, someone has downloaded, if someone's received a suspicious email, then there's a proxy log that says they clicked on a dodgy link. And there's a download of uh, some executable file. They're infected. OK, right now we're seeing weird stuff on their net flow. OK, we're more certain that they've got a virus. Now we're seeing them hitting honeypot files that, or trying to encrypt honeypot files that they have no business going anywhere near. Oh, it's ransomware. Right, OK, we're dead certain of this. We're 99% certain that that PC has now been inf infested with ransomware. We'd better tell the security analyst about it, right? No. You don't tell the security analyst about that because the security analyst is staring at 2,000 other things that are all trying to get his attention. What you do is you take that message with that high confidence that's come straight off your Kafka queue, integrate that with uh, something like your uh, Cloud, uh, CrowdStrike environment, which will immediately isolate that PC from your network. It will basically say to your network switches, no, nope, no more network access to you. And that's what, prevent, that's what protects you from losing all the information on your file shares to a ransomware attack. And at that point, you're like, ah, eh, someone lost some stuff that they happened to be working on on the PC at the time. And everyone backs those up, right? All your client machines are backed up religiously every five minutes. No? Right, OK. But we've got a minimal loss at that point. So what they're actually doing, they've gone a kind of step further, uh, in fact. And yeah, for high confidence messages, they've integrated the orchestration layer of that to say, your PC was infected with ransomware. I'm going to rebuild it now, which is pretty harsh. But you know, if you can imagine just typing away and nearly finish that report, my PC just started rebuilding. <laughs> But you know, that, that ability to respond in machine time, not human time, is also absolutely key to this. And for that, you have to be able to build systems which are able to both integrate with anything through you know, nice bus type technologies like Kafka, but also which are able to build up those kind of confidences so that you, you've got to be pretty certain before you take that kind of action. And which can also really understand the context in which they're taking that action. So they can respond in, yeah, as I say, in machine time, not in human time. So how do you do it, big data? <coughs> Several things. Look at the raw network traffic. How many people ingest and keep all their raw network traffic into their existing SIM platform that has 20 gig of storage? No one. It's possible to do with Hadoop. It's possible to do with the scalability. And it's full of really, really useful information. Bring in all the other data sources, but make sure that there's a way of harmonizing them and normalizing them into a common source so that your data scientists can start from a point of actually knowing what the data means, have some governance around it so that they can get on with their work faster. And also bring in your business data. Think beyond traditional security data. Think about things like the financial data. This is all full of wonderful clues that something is amiss. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's going beyond the sort of simple, you know, traditional data sources that you might get from a few log files and some NetFlow. Um, the flexibility of a lot of the platforms gives you that. Use massively scalable platforms to do this. Use HTTP, use HTF for these. Use Hadoop and the power of the streaming technologies to be able to do that at massive scale because that's what's coming for you. Do it yourself. Take all these wonderful tools. Uh, yeah, mix them out of a toolbox and try and figure out how to spend the next two years plumbing it together. Or use a framework. What we've done is spent the last two years uh, and a bit pulling together a framework 
and a reference implementation which does a lot of this work for you. It provides the parsers to normalize into that standard data format. It provides the enrichment to pull in those real-time information sources. It provides the threat intel integration, and it provides the rules and scoring and the machine learning capabilities and to host within that. What this gives you is the leg up that you need. So you can go out and hire a team of data scientists into your business who will solve these problems for you. They will solve it by building something that looks like about half of that. I've seen this again and again. The sheer number of times I've diagrammed this out on whiteboards for you know, the customers who've gone the DIY approach is just depressing. You know, we've already done the work, so just use it. This will give you a head start. And what we really need to do is take that head start, build that in the community, work together. The bad guys are. They're sharing stuff. Why can't we? This is, um, this, by the way, is the commit graph for uh, Metron. Nice, healthy project. Uh, we used to call it, as you see at the top there, incubator Metron. It's now uh, just passed its vote to become a top-level project, so it's well on its way to that maturity. But yeah, working with people in the open and sharing is the solution to that. And with that, thank you very much. About 10 seconds over, I think, but do we still have some time for questions? Um,